I'd like to call the meeting to order. Ms. Ford, will you call roll, please? Chairman Wingate. Here. Vice Chairman Robinson. Here. Dr. Highlander. Here. Mrs. Hill. Here. Mrs. Jones. Here. Mrs. Lennon. Here. Mr. McClendon. Here. Mr. Smith. Here. Mrs. Thurman. Here. Mr. Harris. Here. Superintendent Dr. Johnson. Here. We have the following uh, request to amend the agenda. Uh, after roll call, add moment of silence, memory of Bill Eldridge. 
Under item seven, delegations, add Jeanette omar Kale, HCEA. Under item 11, board matters, add Dr. Brian Johnson, revised schedule of sessions, calendar revisions for 2018, 2019, 2019, 2020. <coughs> Under item nine, the consent agenda, Agenda, we're going to add board policies for first reading, board policy 4.200, board policy 4.201, board policy 4.202, board policy 4.203, board policy 4.204, board policy 4.206, board policy 4.207, board policy 4.211, Board policy 4.300, board policy 4.402, board policy 4.403, board policy 4.404, board policy 4.407, board policy 4.602, board policy 4.607, and board policy 4.609. Ms. Thurman. Yes, uh, many people in this room knew uh, Mr. Eldridge, and I would uh, just like to read this, please. He's a dear friend of mine, and he passed away on November the 1st. William Jean Bill Eldridge passed away peacefully at home with his family on Thursday, November the 1st, 2018. Bill was born on May 23rd, 1926. He was a graduate of Saudi Daisy High School, the University of Chattanooga, and George Peabody College. He also attended American University in Biarritz, France, while serving in World War II. Bill was a Hamilton County Administrator for 43 years, retiring in 1993. Following his retirement, he served on the Hamilton County School Board for eight years. He was the first principal in surrounding counties to reach a level three of the state's career ladder program. Bill Eldridge is recognized on the Wall of Fame at the Veterans Park by the, by the city of Saudi Daisy for his World War II service and was inducted into the Saudi Daisy High School Hall of Fame in 2013. He was also my high school principal, and like I say, he was also a dear, dear friend of mine, and I would like to take a moment of silence, have a moment of silence for him, please. Thank you. We will also be coming up uh, in this next week on the two-year anniversary uh, of the Woodmore tragedy. And uh, I would also like to take a moment of silence at this time for those uh, children, their families, uh, the community of Woodmore and the school and our community as a whole. Thank you. We will now have our pledge to the flag and our meditation led by Ms. Jane Reynolds, principal of Saudi Daisy Middle School. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to speak first if you guys want to speak. Hang, hang on one second. Hang on one second. I think we need to. I'm approve. sorry. That's right. Approve the agenda. That's right. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. All right, Ms. Ford. Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. All right, Ms. Reynolds, go ahead. Thank you. Chairman Wingate, distinguished members of the board, and Dr. Johnson, it is my honor to be with you this evening, and I hope it's okay if I just share a little bit of my heart as this week I've been thinking about Veterans Day and how we honor our veterans. As a newly reassigned school administrator, I inherited a deep-rooted tradition in celebrating Veterans Day at Saudi Daisy Middle School. In fact, the entire town comes out big for Veterans Day. There are hundreds of flags and church lawns and the public buildings lining the roadways, and every sign in Saudi Daisy is thanking a veteran for their service. There's a big luncheon at the Baptist Church that's free for veterans, and it's $5 for the rest of us. I was told early on I better go to that luncheon. But I, I was a little confused because I'm, I'm not a veteran, but then I realized that by taking part in that tradition that I was doing the best that I could do to honor their, their service. Um, we have a huge program at our school every other year. It's a lot of work, but how much our students gain from being part of such a heartfelt tribute where local veterans are honored guests. 
This is the kind of thing that makes me very proud to live and work in Saudi Daisy. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, the fighting of World War I ended in 1918. Due to the conclusion of World War I, November 11th is universally recognized as a day of celebration. Many of our school-aged children have no concept of service or war or sacrifice because it hasn't been part of their everyday life. In this room filled with school leaders, I urge you, if you don't already participate in some sort of recognition of our veterans, to consider starting a, tr a tradition in our schools to make it a bigger deal to honor veterans than it is to sell five items at a fundraiser. In a world that is divided politically in so many ways, coming together to honor veterans is probably the only thing we can agree on. Veterans are, are, are ordinary people until they're called to duty. They leave their families, they leave their lives, not for fame or glory, but to defend the right that we have and our way of life. In a moment, we will all rise to say the pledge, but for now, if you are a veteran in the room, please rise and let us recognize you. <laughs> And at this time, if everyone would stand and join me in saying the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I feel like I should say you should be seated for the moment of silence, but I won't say that. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Reynolds. Next, we'll have our exemplars of excellence. First up, we have Ms. Jill Levine, Dr. Zach Brown, and Dr. Leandria Ware. Chairman Wingate, members of the board, Dr. Johnson, it is my privilege to introduce you to Ms. Jessica Hubbock. A side note, six years ago, I had the opportunity to ask Ms. Hubbock to join the staff at Howard School, and she said yes, and she accepted the position. You will not find a more dedicated or committed educator in all of Hamilton County. Thank you, Ms. Hubbock, for accepting the challenge at Howard School. The Hamilton County Department of Education is pleased to recognize Jessica Hubbock, a teacher and science department chair at the Howard School. Ms. Hubbick is one of nine educators from across the state to be selected to participate in the inaugural Tennessee Teacher Ambassador Network during the 2018-19 school year. All educators participating in the network came highly recommended and were selected to be ambassadors through a competitive application process. As part of the program, each teacher ambassador will partner with specific division leaders within the State Department. Ms. Hubbick will be partnering with leaders in the Data and Research Division of the Tennessee Department of Education. As Commissioner McQueen stated, unlike other fellowships, this experience ensures teachers are completely embedded in critical areas of our work so we can improve to better serve our students. Please join me in congratulating Ms. Hubbock on this prestigious accomplishment. Ms. Hubbock, please come up and let us shake your hand. Chairman Wingate, members of the board, Dr. Johnson, at this time I'd like to ask several leaders to come forward. And I, I, the room's so full, I'm not quite sure if they're here or if APs are here. But I'm going to ask these leaders to go ahead and come forward. From Best T. Shepherd, Ms. Valerie Brown. And if we have APs, please come up with your principals. From Normal Park, Ms. Carrie Wilmore. Chattanooga Center for Creative Arts, Ms. Debbie Smith. Chattanooga School for the Arts and Sciences Lower School, Ms. Kelly Kofelt. Chattanooga School for the Arts and Sciences Upper School, Mr. Jim Bowles. From Lookout Mountain Elementary, Ms. Ruth White. From Nolan Elementary, Dr. Ashley Wilson. And from Signal Mountain Middle High School, Dr. Shane Harwood. 
Chairman Wingate, we're uh, recognizing these schools uh, this evening as being uh, reward schools for 2018. This is the top distinction in the new accountability system under the state of Tennessee. And they're recognized as reward schools for improving overall student achievement as well as uh, student growth for all student groups and subgroups. This is a huge honor. About 20% of schools across Tennessee uh, receive this honor. And these are the schools from the Rock Point. Yeah, Dr. Sharp's going to be mad if you don't do it. <laughs> Rock Point Learning Communities and the uh, Harrison Bay Learning Communities. So at this time, I want to recognize these schools. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Yes, please come forward. Ready? Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman Wingate Board. Thank you for having us uh, this evening to bring to you uh, what now has become a tradition for us to present to you um, athletic teams who have competed at the highest levels in our state. And uh, the teams we're presenting to you tonight finished as either state runner-ups or state champions uh, during the fall season uh, with the TSSAA. And this first team uh, you see uh, standing in behind me right now with their head coach, Debbie Hill, is the state runner-up in Class A girls volleyball, Sail Creek Middle High School. <laughs> Ms. Thurman, do you have a certificate to present to the team? Very good. Over there. <laughs> no, just walk around, follow your coach around there. There you go. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks for coming out there. Thank you. Good job. You never know. Lindsay, Lindsay is not. All right, Lindsay says, all right, okay. Well, I'll announce her. Okay. I'm not going to announce all the, the, the kids, but since we've got her on the agenda, I'll just take it. That's all right. <laughs> okay. Coming up, we've got several tonight. This is a banner night for athletics in Hamilton County Schools. So coming up next is our Signal Mountain Middle High School girls soccer team who happen to be holding the Class A State Championship Trophy for girls soccer. 
They're here with head coach Richard Northcutt and uh, Miss Lennon. Is she? Uh, there you are. Good. I think you've got, you want to come over here and so they can or, or and get them around over here. Yeah. The girls, you might want to go around get a. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Congratulations. How are you? I'm doing good. Good to see you. Thanks for coming out. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, very good. Um, now we have the uh, the second group we're going to recognize tonight. They all standing over here to my left is the uh, the boys golf team from Signal Mountain, who also happen to be holding a large trophy for a state championship for the small class boys teams in the state of Tennessee. Not present tonight is Lindsay Hollis, who is on the girls' team, and she finished second overall in the individual state championship. All right, now then, let's see. Is there, there wait? There's more trophies. Yeah. Look at this. We got two more. They keep coming. Uh, uh, let's see who we got. This is the uh, state championship cross country team girls' division for small class Signal Mountain state championship right here, girls. Robert, is this the second year for them? Uh, this is the fifth over a fifth time they've won the state championship. Yeah, six years. Fifth out of six years. Uh, thanks, Miss Thurman, for making that point. <laughs> and you're head coach for both teams, yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> So, uh, Maddie Parker, who, who was in that group of girls that just came by, she finished second overall individual in the state, and that's a wor uh, worthy uh, accomplishment as well. Uh, boys division, which is here, with the, Coach Carpenter, who's the head coach for both teams, boys finished second overall in the state this year. And it's... And, uh, Coach Carpenter, about correct, it's that the highest finish highest in the boys' finish. history ever. All right. Very good. All right. Thank you. Just put it down over there if you want. That's it. No, no. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> 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 
I will say, you know, we, we just added a, a, a countywide AD position, and man, that thing's really paying off, Mr. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. That moves us on to presentations. We will have a presentation by the SSAC officers. Can I just I just say, board, you all know that we get to meet with uh, the Student Advisory Council once a month. And uh, this year we started going around the schools, and they've done some work around uh, action plans they have for a couple of years at a, at a conference. And Noah, uh, turn it over to you all. Okay. Uh, Chairman Wingate, uh, Dr. Johnson, and school board members, thank you for allowing us to share with you information about the Superintendent's Student Advisory Council and the recent Youth Summit. The SSAC is comprised of two students from every high school in the district. We meet six times a year, primarily to interact with our school superintendent, to provide information about various happenings in our schools, and to learn about operations and procedures with the school district. One of the best parts of the SSAC is that we're given an opportunity to provide input on critical issues. For example, at yesterday's meeting, we discussed our opinions on the code of behavior. My name is Irvi Shaw, and I'm a student at Udawa High School, and I'm also the Superintendent Student Advisory Council webmaster. The Youth Summit was an important training opportunity for student leaders to look specifically into their individual schools and look for improvements. A total of 266 students attended and were trained by STARS on strategies to improve the school climate. During this training, we worked with our school teams and discussed positive things about our schools and then things we could improve. Afterwards, we focused on developing an action plan to build to build up our school climate and culture. The action plans were taken back to our schools, shared with our school administration in an effort to uh, work towards our goals and establish that we established during the event. Uh, hello, I'm Xavier Chavez. I'm a student at CCA and I'm the secretary of the SSAC. Um, at our most recent uh, SSAC meeting at Lookout Valley High School, we were able to discuss uh, action plans and progress from each school that were made at the Youth Summit. Um, one in particular we noticed was the principal student advisory councils that were created, um, inspired by the SSAC at many schools, including uh, Lookout Valley, Red Bank, and uh, Sail Creek. Um, in addition to that, some other of uh, the action plans that were implemented was something called Mix It Up Mondays, which is once again what Sail Creek was doing, which is uh, an event during their lunchtime where they would uh, move tables in order to uh, decrease clicks and um, increase the amount of student cohesion throughout the whole school. Um, and then my school, CCA, actually, uh, in the spirit of increasing student voice, has recently um, uh, taken up having students do many of the morning announcements and uh, we're very thankful for our principal for allowing us to do that and um, for the SAC for giving us a uh, chance to share our uh, plans. One of the great things of, of, about the uh, SSAC is that it gives all the schools in attendance the opportunity to share any ideas that uh, are effective for them and to show the progress of the action plan so that all the other schools can learn um, from the schools in their fellow communities and uh, implement them in their own different and unique ways. I'm Veronica Robinson and I attend Collegiate High and I'm Vice Chairperson. So overall, we the student representatives of our Hamilton County School District are, commu are committed to making a positive difference in our schools. We pledge to be a part of the solution rather than be a part of the problem. Our theme for the Youth Summit was improving the culture and so we present to, uh, to School Board Chairman Wingate our signed commitment of the 266 participants to this ongoing process of working to improve the climate and culture of each of our schools.
Chairman, if I could just add, uh, Ms. Karen Glenn, could you raise your hand back there in the back? She's a uh, STARS and over culture and climate and does a great job coordinating uh, not just these students, but all the students that are part of the, uh, the, the group. So thank you, Karen, uh, for your work and leadership. All right, next we'll have a presentation regarding our future ready updates. John Maynard. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman Wingate, School Board Members, Superintendent Johnson, for having me, and a special thank you, Ms. Thurman, for that, for my principal, too, and uh, I appreciate that thought of him. Yeah, and school board person, so appreciate that. Um, I'm going to update you tonight on the Future Ready 2023 uh, report. John, you're just going to have to talk about CT a little bit till we and, get the right report up there. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so I'll, I'll give a high level yeah, as ahead. a transition to slides. You know, one of our goals is future ready students and making sure that we are uh, preparing all of our students and exposing them to uh, really challenging and rigorous coursework. And obviously, there's been much talk about um, career technical education opportunities and really ensuring that we're exposing our students to career technical education opportunities. So you'll see John, he'll start out, he'll go through some of the key performance indicators that are there, uh, but then also talk about some of the work uh, within our system, uh, kind of school by school uh, and where we are and kind of some next steps. So. Uh, so as, as they get ready to pull this up, that kind of gives some framing and context to, to what the presentation is. Can you find it? <laughs> well, while, we, while we're getting that queued up, um, something really cool that's a future ready step that I got to experience this week was going with the fifth graders from Lookout Valley Elementary to tour uh, UTC. They actually got to tour a dorm. They got to go to the art department. They did some coding and they learned all about college. And from what I learned from that, I think we're going to have a lot of elementary school students that are going to have that opportunity. And it sounds like it's our counselors that are coordinating that. So I'm um, I thank you all for that. It was it was really neat to see them in front of that enormous library <laughs> and thinking about what was next for them. Yeah, UTC has been doing that. I think it's a great program. They have put that out to elementaries to, to do, and I know a lot of them have taken advantage of it. So, um, John, we have the presentation. I've got just a lot of yeah. Oh, okay. I'll just start it. That'll be good. Keep going. Uh, I want to update you on the Future Ready Students, which is the number two of the Future Ready 2023 plan. And the, uh, if you could see the screen, I've got two or three reminders for you. Uh, and one of them is the uh, KPIs, the performance indicators that uh, go along with the Future Ready students. Um, and then the key strategies are to engage every child and prepare all students for college and career. And we're going to kind of focus on the second key strategy, preparing all students for college and career. Um, and we're going to go about doing that by continuing to create some non-traditional pathways to graduation like our Gestamp program, our Volkswagen Mechatronics Academy, our Polytech Academy. We're really going to also work hard in the high schools at expanding our EPSOs, our early post-secondary opportunities. I know Dr. Johnson mentioned y'all talked about this this weekend at the retreat, but uh, we're trying to make sure that every student uh, has the opportunity for more advanced placement courses, more um, dual enrollment, dual credit, IB, industry certifications. Um, and so we're 
trying to make that accessible to all students. So that's a, a big part of this work. Um, we will also tr working towards developing what we're calling future ready now, uh, which is to try to build out the work-based learning program where we have, you know, we have students right today that across the street at this plant, there's 10 students. They made uh, $10 an hour working four hours today. And then they took a bus about a mile down the road here to the other Gestamp plant and um, worked in their learning lab, finishing up their high school work online. Uh, they are part of a certified apprenticeship program. I don't know if y'all saw that. Um, so I'll get us moved forward here to, oh, went too far, didn't I? And then we also are launching and developing our Future Ready Institutes and everything that's involved with that. I'll kind of I'll talk, dig into that just a little bit deeper here in a moment. Dr. Johnson asked me, he said, what, give, us a, give us a good definition of career and tech education. And I'll tell you, I love what our school board and our uh, school administrators did, our school district, with this second bullet on future ready students, because it says our overarching mission is to ensure our students are successful after graduation, work to help. Well, in my mind, I, you know, our overarching mission of CTE is the same. It's to ensure our students are successful after graduation, work to help students identify interests, skills, abilities, pursue their preferred options for college and career. We're gonna have 13,000 students that will take a high school or middle school career and tech edu education class this year, which I'm, I'm proud of that, but I, I really wanna, you know, a, a goal of mine is to, is to get, keep moving that needle up. I know most of y'all might realize we actually get more state funds from the state for every student we have in CTE programs. So it behooves us in multiple ways to, to keep building our programs up, not, not just because of the funds, but of course because of the opportunities that the students get in these programs. Um, and just to remind you again, this is uh, the ready graduate is uh, a part of this um, so you can become a ready graduate by either getting the 21 or higher, four EPSOs, two EPSOs and an industry certification, two EPSOs, and the ASVAB score. Uh, I really like the state has gone to this. I think this is a great way. Ready graduates, 20% of the high school's accountability now. Uh, I, I, I think it's great because it's in our control a lot more. I mean, if a student gets four EPSOs, that, that's us to us. us. You know, we get to, we get, we're all, we've got to offer that. We've got to get that student in that pathway to do that. Uh, I, I love this is 20%. It's so much more in our uh, ability to schedule it and plan it and control that aspect of the accountability. Uh, all right, this one is real busy. So if you're looking at your paper, for looking at the screen. Let me take you through it. But look down the left side first, just down the very far left side. CTE is made up of 16 clusters. So this is where we put all our CTE programs into a particular cluster. And just for a moment, I'm not gonna spend long on this, but now look across. Don't look up and down, look across. Like you look at the top line, the advanced manufacturing, and you can see we have the we have programs that are in the advanced manufacturing cluster at Sequoia, Howard, and Tyner. And then if you look down, for example, at the arts, AV tech, and communication, we have programs at all those schools. Um, I think this grid is a good one to, uh, it's, it's one I use, it's one the superintendent and staff will use as we are looking at, um, are we meeting the industry demand? You know, uh, you, you kind of look at this right off, and I mean, advanced manufacturing, health science, or what? Dr. Johnson liked literally every meeting we go to. It's uh, uh, health science and advanced manufacturing in this area. And um, so you can tell, like, for example, with advanced manufacturing, I, you know, I feel like we've got 
a lot of work there. You know, we 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 got to we got to do some things there, um, and then you look at the AV tech. You know, do we have too many things there? So those are kind of the you know that's a little bit of what this grid kind of guides us. Um, the next couple of slides, I did want you to just see uh, the particular schools. Um, you know, Ms. Robinson, you can see what Howard offers as far as in these career clusters. Uh, you know, Ms. Thurman, Saudi Daisy, and uh, so that just gives you an idea of the career clusters. Um, you might look at you look at this slide. Just look at this one just a second. You look at Hicks, and you think, well, they only offer three three in their career cluster. Well, here's the thing. At Hickson, they have three ag teachers, two business teachers, and three um, health science teachers. And he's begging for a fourth health science. So there's something to be said for us looking at um, maybe a little. I, I actually like what Hickson's done. I like a little bit less of the wide buffet and a little bit more of a robust program. You know, I mean, uh, it's, I'll tell you, for a CT teacher, a great example is, uh, I could pick any number of people, but I'll just take uh, the health science teacher at Tyner. I mean, the students love her. She does a great job. She has a great program. You know, Miss Stone does. and. It's just her, though. You know, she's trying to build that program up four years of it. <laughs> okay, so she's teaching some health science one. She's trying to get enough students in there for that class and and two and three and four. So we've got to look at uh, uh, some um, just kind of how we're delivering this. And I, I do think the Future Ready Institutes are are helping guide this. Um, you'll see that just in a second. Um, speaking of the Future Ready Institutes, I wanted you just to see at your at all the schools, the particular the ones that are highlighted show you the theme or the CTE path that is in currently in a Future Ready Institute. So you can kind of tell uh, what courses are in each of those. And really the next slide is the one I, I really want to spend time with. I want to build it up. This is this is a slide, um, actually the one after this. <laughs> Let me tell you about this slide real quick. Of those 16 career clusters, okay, in each cluster there are programs of study. All right. So, for example, in advanced manufacturing, which we saw we had had three schools had advanced manufacturing, you could either do machining, electromechanical, mechatronics, or welding. So, and as it turned out, we have like at Sequoia we have welding and machining. At Howard we have welding, and at um, Tyner we had mechatronics. So there's these also these programs of studies within the cluster. So we just wanted to give you some examples. There's architecture and construction, and education and training. And so up to this point, I've kind of talked about what we want to do, the things that we're looking at. Uh, our vision for doing these. And this next slide, <clears throat> to me, the important thing is because it tells how we're going to do it. It, it it's, the, it's the guide of how we're going to do this. So I want to kind of walk you through this one. I've got a couple others that are similar, show you uh, two other schools. But let's say you are at Howard in our welding program. You want to be in advanced manufacturing. So your freshman year, you're going to take principles of manufacturing. While you're in that class, you're going to get your OSHA 10 certif industry certification, and you're going to uh, work towards your level one industry certification in either NIMS or SNAP-ON. Um, your sophomore year, <clears throat> you'd be in welding one uh, and be working towards your AWS, which is the uh, Welding Society entry-level welder. So again, you're working on an industry certification while you're in the CTE class. And then junior, senior, and post-secondary, and this is the real shift for CTE is is really shifting to thinking of post secondary. You know that's the that's what the second goal is, and that's that's where we're uh, going to move them. But junior year, for example, you could take your welding two, you get your advanced welding certification. Senior year, we'd love for that student to be half the year in an internship, or apprenticeship, a work-based learning, a co-op. 
some type of, you know, we set their schedule so that they can go out and actually be on a job site like across the street here at Gestomp. And then their post-secondary would be being hired out of high school with these industry certifications and with that work experience. Uh, last year, we was first year we did the Gestomp, the Gestomp program, 30 students did it. 14 of them are working over there right now full time with benefits. Um, and if they choose to go to college, Gestomp will pay it for them. So, uh, but uh, another group of students might say, well, you know what, I want to do dual enrollment and I want to get involved uh, and we could offer dual enrollment classes on Howard's campus and that student could go on and enroll in the engineering tech at Chat State. Uh, a third option that we're working on for that student is to actually use TCAT. They have a welding tech program that right now currently has 100% placement. Okay, they can't, as fast as the students can come out of TCAT's welding tech program, they're getting hired. We could uh, do, we could begin that welding tech program at Howard. Instead of the student taking welding two or three, we're going to just start them in the welding tech program with TCAT, try to get a third or two thirds of that program done while they're in high school. They might just have, they could graduate from Howard in May and finish at TCAT in August and be in the workforce right then making uh, no telling what. Those those folks make, they're, they're doing well. So that just kind of gives you an idea, but the same could hold true if you're a student at East Ridge High and they're building and design. Um, this is what we're working on at East Ridge is, you know, the fundamentals of construction. If you wanted to be an electrician sophomore year, you're working towards an NCCER, which is an industry certification. And then kind of, you can see the same similar types of pathways, TCAT, Chattanooga State, dual enrollment, and um, straight to the job on the industry certifications. And same type thing with the, uh, if you were in our teaching and learning Future Ready Institute at Tyner, uh, taking fundamentals of education, having mentors, field experiences, um, take teaching as a profession one, get a local dual credit with Chattanooga State's program. And then I want to call your attention to that top line here because junior year you could take teaching as a profession two and senior year uh, and I want to compliment uh, our head of HR, Mr. Fogelman. He's uh, broke broken ground for us now on hiring our own students. Uh, we've got three students at Tyner right now that are being paid as seniors work-based learning that are working at Brown Elementary and uh, Shepherd Elementary. We're going to do a lot more of that. We're talking about doing that with HVAC. We're talking about doing that with other areas of because let me tell you something these the students will be great employees they're very very they're so coachable they are you know they want to work a lot of them need to work a lot of them this is why they're having a hard time in school is that they're having to work in the evening well if we can do that during the day while they're in a career field while they're getting credit you know that's that's uh that's what Okay, I've got uh, Dr. Johnson. Sorry, I get, I get a little excited talking about <laughs> talking about these opportunities, but uh, so I'll, I, I'll keep us moving. But uh, of course, our next steps, you know, looking at building out the future ready institutes. We want to optimize uh, the the building that we have at Helmut County High. We've got some plans moving forward there. Uh, the TCAT High School model. That's what I was talking about earlier. Our teachers, instead of potentially teaching like welding two and three we actually start using our teachers as TCAT instructors um, and really building out more future ready now programs uh, we've got the Gestomp when I talked about the Tyner when I talked about uh, right now Volkswagen's telling us if these students if a student will go through this AMPA which is an online um, advanced manufacturing production assistant program it's got so many hours. We've got three or four instructors trained on it. They go through that program. They're saying they'll hire them. Uh, they, they've got that much with the, the new lines that are coming on out there. Um, and so 
you know, that's a that's a neat opportunity. Um, you know, next steps, and, and this is getting to where, uh, you know, we've got to look at our deployment of resources. We're going to have to look at um, uh, what programs we have where, and you know, some of them, y'all, we're going to need to retire. And there's some things that we need to be doing that we're either not doing or we're not doing enough of to meeting the industry demand. And those are things, of course, that that Dr. Johnson and staff and I work on. Uh, but that's that's a that's a not an easy thing either, because a lot of times these the programs are kind of entrenched, um, and uh, so. But we're going to look hard. We're going to. Uh, I've committed this year <laughs> to making sure that you know, board members know, and Dr. Johnson will. If there is going to be some type of move, we're going to try to give y'all a heads up ahead of time. But really, nowhere we're not thinking of anybody losing something and not gaining. We're thinking of moving a few things around. But we need to build them up. We need to build up robust programs at all the schools uh, so um, and, you know here again CTE support staff I mean if Murfreesboro has eight people on their CTE staff and all of them are paid by the school system Knoxville has ten people on their staff I have they're all paid by the school system I have four that counts me <laughs> and two of those we have to take out of our Perkins money which is a little bit sad because we're kind of really need to be ought to be using that for the equipment you know so that's just something we've got to consider and the future ready build out it has some of the same issues as far as staffing and and uh, really because uh, let me i know i'm taking too long um, but this right here y'all like this is a whole thing okay this is just one group of students at eastridge high school and look at it it's a whole thing you know what I mean by that? It's that's a lot of management. That's a lot of counselors knowing things, community knowing things, building businesses. You know, that's a whole thing, and that's just right there. That's just 40 students at East Ridge High per grade or something. So, okay. Thank y'all. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. I might have used my Mr. discussion time up. <laughs> Mr. Smith. You know, I think it's amazing what's going on. And we can't get excited about this when comments over. So uh, I do have a question. That, is there any way, or you guys talked about any way that you could incorporate uh, some of these pathways at the adult high school? Has there been any conversation about that? At Hamilton County High? At the adult high school. Yeah, out like, yeah, you're calling it adult high school. I'm calling it Hamilton County High, but we all know what we're talking about. Yes, we've got, that's one of the things we've got. Uh, I've worked up a proposal that I've worked closely with Dr. Johnson on about transitioning that school back to a school that would serve Udawan Central. So we're looking at what it's going to take. We actually had a huge break about a month ago. I guess I can say this, but uh, uh, TCAT Chattanooga is redoing their welding program in, in their building, one of their buildings. And they came to us and said, we need a place to put our welding program while we're remodeling. And oh, by the way, we're going to get all new equipment and we'll leave that equipment wherever we go they figure it's worth about five hundred thousand dollars what they're going to do a welding program is very expensive so we're i'm pretty excited we're going to get to have a welding program out there now we got to figure out how to get the students there <laughs> to take advantage of it <laughs> and that I, I didn't mention that was the transportation bullet on there is there is some you know there is some things that we want to do that's going to we, we got to get Udawan Central students there, or actually, with the uh, uh, they would have future ready institutes, and so any student could go there. 
So one, one did that answer your question? Is that what you meant? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I think that's great because you have a lot of kids out there that somehow fell through the cracks and then now they resurrected themselves. Yeah. Actually, the, the stomp program is probably half of them are those students. Yeah. They, they right now, I mean, I think that's been great for that uh, that group of students, the, the adult high school students. The, the, the job that they do out there is incredible yeah, anyway yeah. so yeah. one of one other just thought is they're in these different career paths and and the, i mean they still got to do their math and their english and and all that stuff and i think i mentioned this before just to kind of be on the radar screen but those uh, those I, and i'm really not sure what you even call them graduation coaches or whatever that what, what's the official title <laughs> yeah I, you know i don't know how those guys do it just working part-time and, and you know, and I, and I know yeah, you're talking about the college and career advisors. Yes, right, yeah, right. Hey, I'm all over this. They, and, uh, you know, uh, I know that comes with a price know, tag, but man, yeah. we got to figure out a way that those guys can work. We're having a hard time keeping them because it's part time too. We we train them up, and we get a real valuable and and uh, uh, you know I don't I'd say every one of y'all in here probably know one of them you know at, at your schools and uh, we get them trained and then it's just not worth it to them necessarily to stay or else they're staying because it's a good cause and you know they're they're doing it because they're committed to it. We have had a lot of turnover lately, so that's a concern. Ms. Mosley Jones. Oh, I have a question about the whole collaboration with the TCAT program at Hamilton County High. With Chattanooga State or the TCAT program be incurring some of the costs for that building? I know we spend a lot of money on that building for the amount of students that's in there. And so I'm just wondering, with, in collaboration, would that be a discussion of possibly picking that up so maybe if we wouldn't spend a lot of money on the building because TCAT was in there, you could use the money to go somewhere else? Yeah. I know that's not that's much. Over Dr. Johnson, not much. Maybe you could answer that. Well, are you, oh. are you, um, so the equipment that's coming is coming from TCAT. Yeah, the um, equipment they're donating so, basically. So we're not really incurring any costs as far as uh, the equipment that's coming in. Uh, obviously, maintenance will work with them to see mm -hmm. how we can leverage the setup. And there's some uh, moving out of old things that are obsolete and things of that nature. Um, I don't know if that's getting at what you're asking. But that, they're only going to be there for eight months, right. six or seven months, and then leave everything. And then we hope to move students back in there now. Okay, I guess my concern Central. was with, with the population increase. I, I think I just have, a, and I've never really said anything about this, but I really yeah. just have a concern with the so, amount of kids that are in that building and how much it costs us to use that. Yeah, building. so we have yeah. several buildings. I think uh, when you look at our utilization report, we have several buildings that yeah. we know we have to have intimate conversation about. John's in the infancy stages of working on uh, a Sequoia plan where, you know, there may be some partnership with TCAT, uh, you know, kind of across our district where we are from a utilization context. Hampton County High is definitely one of those schools where there's got to be real conversation about how do we maximize that building. I think looking at Central right. and Ottawa are really good options uh, to consider uh, really how we leverage those buildings in a more uh, intentional way. So I'm just going to, um, Joe Smith was going to add one thing we're also looking at is uh, we've had a lot of really good conversations with the Chamber, uh, Chattanooga State, uh, around uh, and just uh, Blake Lunt, some uh, industry councils we did. Uh, started actually yesterday and what we're really trying to leverage leverage is all their opportunities for uh, apprenticeships externships things of that nature for kids for teachers as well uh, and really trying to move from um, from being uh, really uh, static in one place to really mobilizing to the communities uh, because once you start to really talk about some of the the challenges that you know we experience whether it be East Ridge whether it be uh, Howard whether it be you know, in Saudi days, it doesn't matter where it is. If it's kind of in one location, it's hard to get everybody with as big as our county is. It's hard to get everybody there. So we've really been having conversations about how do we mobilize ourselves? How do we leverage our buildings as right. places, as hubs right. for training and skill development yeah. uh, for parents as well as students? So all those are conversations that, you know, we'll continue to have. Obviously, there's a much deeper conversation to be had about um, capital and building and maximizing usage but um, but then there's also just some some conversation to have around you know how do we take what's there and I and I use Sequoia even though we didn't go into Sequoia today um, how do we take what's there and really maximize it and develop some partnerships 
that really could help us uh, move those buildings forward. So, yeah. Ms. Hill. Um, I wonder within these programs, is there any kind of um, soft skill work that's being done? We as a board have been talking a lot about those things that employers look for, you know, the ability to, to be on time, to work in a team, mm -hmm. to speak with a group. Um, and I know that some other school districts have created kind of a work ready diploma. Uh, is there right. a component? We that? have, uh, we do the work readiness diploma also um, had several, well, everybody that had Volkswagen last year received one just about. But um, I, I'll just tell you that the short answer is yes, I think our CTE teachers would tell you they're doing that. Okay. However, I would tell you my answer is if we can get, let me tell you, these students at Gaston, they got it. They have to be there on time. They have a boss. They get docked. They, if they get six points, they get fired. They're back at the high school. We've had that happen a couple of times. Uh, um, there's nothing like moving towards a more work-based learning, internship, apprenticeship model, especially for our seniors. It'll flat out teach them that. Like you take these three Tyner students going to those elementaries. They got to be there at a certain time. They got a boss. They've got to have customer service. They, you know what I mean? Like, and they coached them up before they went on soft skills. So I, I really hope I'm wanting us, and I know Dr. Johnson is too. He's he's pushing me on it, <laughs> and, he, and I don't need a lot of pushing, but he's pushing me on these on the job opportunity because I think that's where they really get it. I mean, they get it when they, hey, listen, we've got uh, three students Uber to work. To Gaston, they don't, they don't, they take the bus. They can't rely on their family transportation to get them there. They Uber there and pay for it. So, Dr. Highlander, uh, I just want to commend you, Dr. Johnson and John, both, for trying to utilize Harrison Bay back again as for a vocational use. Those bays have been sitting there; they're unheated and you know, but they're rusting, and we're renovating those and putting them back into use, and that's great. Mm -hmm. I, I do think the adult high school is very beneficial. We've got kids there that are getting diplomas that would not be getting diplomas. I, I strongly advocated for maybe once Hillcrest is shut down for putting an adult high school there. It's more centrally located. It's in, in the transportation hub with bus service. And and I think the adult high school concept is good. But where it is, it's not accessible to a lot yeah. of students. That, it doesn't yeah, make but, a lot of sense right. where it is. Uh, right. We've got a, actually got a spread chart of every student that's at at uh, Helm County High right now, and there'll be 90 of them are from one side of the river, and there's right. eight from the other side of the river. And, and I mean, I, they, I, kids just can't get out I, there. I totally it, understand you know? that. So that's why I'd say uh, once Hillcrest is closed, that's that's why Coca Cola yeah. plant moved where yeah. it did. The yeah. bottling plant because right. it's the center hub and Hillcrest. We, mm. we have that's a valuable piece of property yeah. that we have for use for they can come from all over the city to that central hub there mm -hmm. if that can be renovated. Pardon me. Well, we could they might I think they could both be put in there. Yeah, we want to look at uh, we want to look at every option and I think that uh that uh there may be option to bring some things together and be thoughtful about uh, about what we do. So, mm -hmm. thank you, John. Yeah, thank y'all. We move on to our delegations. We have Ms. Jeanette Omar Kell from HCEA. Thank you for your interest in addressing the Hamilton County Board of Education. During your presentation, please address the board as a whole, not individual board members or administrators. Also, do not present complaints or concerns you have about an individual employee of the school system. If you wish to voice those complaints and concerns, you should contact the central office and ask for a meeting with the superintendent. If you're criticizing an individual, I will interrupt you and ask you to refrain. If you continue to criticize individual employees or if your remarks are in error or are becoming repaired, Repetitive, I may interrupt you and ask you to sit down. Please limit your remarks to five minutes. I will tell you when you have one minute left. 
you may begin. Thank you. Greetings, Chairman Wingate, Dr. Johnson, and board members. This is National Education Week. The National Education Association was one of the organizations and creators and original sponsors of American Education Week. Distressed that 25% of the country's World War I draftees were illiterate and 9% were physically unfit, representatives of the NEA and the American Legion met in 1919 to seek ways to generate public support for education. The conventions in both organizations adopted resolutions of support for a national effort to raise public awareness of the importance of education. In 1921, the NEA Representative Assembly in Des Moines, Iowa, called for a designation of one week each year to spotlight education. In its resolution, the NEA called for an educational week observed in all communities annually for the purpose of informing the public of the accomplishments and needs of the public schools and to secure the cooperation and support of the public in meeting those needs. The first observance of American Education Week occurred December 4th through 10th, 1921, with the NEA and American Legion as the co-sponsors. A year later, the then U.S. Office of Education joined the effort as a co-sponsor, and the PTA followed in 1938. Since then, 10 national organizations and associations and councils have joined in the effort. American Education Week is now celebrated the week prior to the week of Thanksgiving given each year. Traditionally, this week has been spent and uh, has been spent as a time to honor and to appreciate our parents, our education support professionals, and our substitutes. But I feel that we would be remiss in not recognizing another very important group that needs to be honored, and that's you, our elected school board members. You are important trustees of the public education system. The most important responsibility you have is to work with the community to improve student achievement and in all of the local public schools. Your educators appreciate your commitment to a vision of high expectations for students' achievement. Your strong beliefs and values about students' abilities to learn and our ability to teach all children at high levels. You show accountability is important as you reach out to central office, your schools, and your community for input and direction. This collaboration is an important part of your work as you seek to make the best decisions for the district. We have witnessed you researching and seeking to understand the data and using that to look at the best use of resources to meet the district goals. You are a strong team with each of you bringing your unique perspective and gifts to the table. Hammond County Education Association wants to present you with a certificate of appreciation for your commitment to edu public education in Hamilton County and to thank you for all that you do to support public education. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Jeanette. Next, we need to approve the minutes of the October 18th meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. You ready, Ms. Ford? Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Uh, next, we need to approve the consent agenda. We have a motion. So moved. <clears throat> Second. All right. Do we need to have uh, any items we need to pull here? Go ahead, Ms. Thurman. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. okay. I want to pull uh, 9B1A CSAS upper trip to uh, Madrid, Spain, please. Dr. Highlander. That's one I was going to question also. 
Yep, I'd like to pull 10A2. Okay, I think we're ready for the vote. Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Uh, yes, this is one of the trips that I've talked about in the past. It's, it's taking place from June the 7th through the 22nd. Uh, the kids are not in school. Um, this is just something that I, I think if they want to go, they can go. I don't know why we have to vote on this. If something happens, that puts us responsible. Um, and so I just, I just don't know if, if we want to go on a trip or they don't go, why we have to sanction this trip. It's just my feelings. Dr. Highlander. Just a question. That, I think the principal's here unless she left. They do pay, uh, the students pay themselves for this trip. Is that, is she here, Ms. Smith? They do. That's correct. That is correct. Is do we they have, get the money from families on the... Right. Are the sponsors, I mean, the uh, is their faculty sponsor going with them? Correct. There's two. Uh, Chelsea Glass, I believe, is the name trying to find it on here yes okay that's that maybe i may to redirect the question to mr camp our attorney what what is our liability in line with what mr thurman said what do you think our liability would be on a field trip that we approve that student paid a teacher directed what what is our liability on that well, I, I suppose in general, in general I generally mean, that would depend. That would just depend on the circumstances. I mean, it would depend on on precisely what happened. I mean, if anything did happen that would give rise to the allegation of liability, it would it would be very fact specific and very circumstance specific. I, I guess what I'm thinking of the nature. Well, I, I've traveled internationally, and there's some dangerous things. And and I know it's good for 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 Spanish students to study in Spain. I mean, that's wonderful, but. But I'm thinking you know, if there's an international incident, would we be held responsible for that? Terrorism or whatever? Well, would, would the school system be held responsible that? I, I mean, it, it, if it is a, if it's a school-sponsored event, so it would fall under that umbrella. Now, ultimately, would the school be held responsible for, for some sort of event like that? I, we couldn't say. I mean, I couldn't say right now. But... As a field trip, you know, in other field trips that we have, if a student, no one is denied because they can't afford it. Uh, maybe Dr. Robertson can help me on this. They can't, on a normal child's field trip, if they can't afford it, we, we take enough money up that they can go, right? On a no, normal not, field trip. No, you're not allowed to do that. You can't make kids pay more. Well, let me rephrase. We give scholarships for... We'll find some other way. But we this, find other ways that should, no child is denied a field trip because they can't afford if it. If it's during the school day. Okay. Since this is not during the school okay. day, then that rule I, I would not wanted, apply. Is that right? That, that's what I thought. Yeah, I wanted it, to clarify It has to be during that. the school day, and right. it has to be connected to the curriculum. Correct. Yeah. Uh, okay. And this being outside, we've got you know, just a little... Yeah, Scott, Scott clarified at our last conversation about field trips that overseas field trips were within our purview to approve. And that's why I wanted him to clarify. That's why I wanted him to clarify. This that is the, this is the same asked. field trip, uh, and Ms. Hill is correct, that, that we discussed when we went over the policy a week or so ago. I mean, this was the exact field trip that uh, I believe Ms. Thurman brought up. Um, just so happens that it comes up the very next meeting. <laughs> All right, do we do we have a motion to put that back on or Ms. Thurman? Okay. I motion to put it back on. I'll make a motion, yes, to put it back on. Second. Okay. Okay, Ms. Ford. Dr. Hollander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Leonard? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? No. Mr. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Um, is Justin Witt here? Um, I, I just wanted to pull um, 
the CSX electrical easement request for Howard High School. Um, I certainly um, plan to vote. That's under oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. I don't need to pull anything. Thanks, Justin. Y'all let me pull it. Nobody corrected me. All right. You pulled it. I know. Carry on. All right. So I believe that was all there, right? Yes. Okay. So now we'll go to administrative uh, business matters. <laughs> Ms. Robinson. Alpine Crest is first. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry. Let me get ahead of myself. All right. So um, do, do I have a motion to approve the Alpine Crest property line adjustment? So moved. Second. Oh, yeah. Justin, could you explain the Alpine Crest, what's going on? Yeah, what, what we have there is um, our, our, our neighbor that borders the uh, rear property line of Alpine Crest uh, realize we just a, a property line cleanup where we're actually going to deed a section of a sliver of property to him and he's going to deed a sliver of property to us and it's just a natural barrier of an existing wall that's going to allow him to maintain that wall and maintain the property behind that wall um, and then what that's going to allow us to do is have legal access to a, an existing sidewalk that connects to the school at Alpine Crest. Um, the back side behind the playground yeah um what is that ravenwood subdivision back back in that section yeah yeah we're just cleaning that's it where up. joe used to walk to school isn't it joe <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> All right, so I think we've had a motion and a second. We're ready. We're ready for a vote. Man's tired of you bums using his property. That's it. <laughs> Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Leonard. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Thurman. Yes. Chairman Wingate. Yes. All right. Now the easement requested Howard, Mr. Robinson. And and this just to explain real yeah. quick. Um, this is on the um, the rear section near the railroad tracks on the recently acquired Poss Homes parcel. Um, we were approached by CXX to um, provide an electrical easement to access some improvements that they're doing on the railroad tracks. It's on the border of the property. It shouldn't affect our our property whatsoever. And they've actually um, offered a ten thousand five hundred dollars for the for the so um, the only thing that I wanted to bring up is if we don't have plans for that $10,500 yet, I'd like to ask that it go back to the school, either back to like the athletic program or something maybe that Dr. Ware decides how it's allocated. So I wanted to bring that up as a discussion point. I have no idea if that's actually something that the board need to approve or if that's just something that you can earmark within your within your uh, funds. Usually I haven't I have not um, allocated it. Well, I'm just asking for approval. Um, but usually we do normally we do approve that. Yeah, while we're I mean Dr. Highlander. I would second if that she put that in the form of motion, I would second her motion. <laughs> I don't think it has. Okay. I move to give the money back to Howard. Yeah. I second it. <laughs> we got two motions and two seconds. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. But we got to retract. Let, let, let's approve the item first. Yeah, let's approve the item. All right. We have any more discussion on that there? All right. So I have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All right, Ms. Ford. Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Sermon. Yes. Chairman Wingate. Yes. And I think we also had a motion here on the floor. Yes, uh, a motion to um, give the 10500 back to the school to let them decide how it will be spent. Did I second? I'm not sure that we need a motion that. Okay. But we can go ahead. And if we don't, we will put it we, we can. Can we request to have a follow up on that being directed? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. Uh, wait, what am I requesting? For, for a follow up for that money to be directed from, where you'd like for it to go back to the school. Budget amendment. 
Okay. Comes in, it might just be a budget amendment. It's not. Am I making a motion for that? No. That's what I'm. Got it. Out. Perfect. I'm, yeah, I don't think you have yes, to do a motion. Do, do whatever. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's move on here to our board policies. Uh, Dr. Towns Elbers, do you have anything you want to say about these at all? This is second final reading. Um, no, this is just bringing back the policies that we put forth for first reading on last month. So we're bringing them for adoption uh, with your approval this month. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve board motion. policy 3.200? Motion to approve. Second. All right, Ms. Ford. Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Thurman. Yes. Chairman Wingate. Yes. Do I have a motion to approve board policy 3.201? So moved. Second. Okay, Ms. Ford. Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Thurman. Yes. Chairman Wingate. Yes. Do I have a motion to approve Board Policy 3.202? Yes. So approved. Second. Motion to approve. Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Thurman. Yes. Chairman Wingate. Yes. Do I have a motion to approve board policy 3.205? So moved. Second. Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Thurman. Yes. Chairman Wingate. Yes. Do I have a board policy or a motion to approve board policy 3.206? So moved. Second. Board policy Twilight Zone. <laughs> Dr. Hammond. Yes. Mrs. Seal. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Sermon. Yes. Chairman Wingate. Yes. Do I have a motion to approve board policy 3.209? Move to approve. Second. Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Thurman. Yes. Chairman Wingate. Yes. Do I have a motion to approve board policy 3.403? So moved. Second. <laughs> Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Thurman. Yes. Chairman Wingate. Yes. Do I have a motion to approve board policy 3.500? So moved. Second. May I have a question right here, please, real quick? Oh, yes, I had a couple of calls about this, about the vending machines. Do none of our schools have vending machines for the students? Even with the new regulations? They do. Well, okay. Well, it says here that the uh, vending machines may be operated by the school in employee lounges for employee use only. And some people said, well, we have vending machines. Are we in violation? Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't have a, a lot of people use a vending machine money to buy things at their school. But... I, I guess did, I didn't catch this when I read over this the first yeah, time. Yeah, there, there's so. some certain regulations um, in child nutrition, and, and we can get Kristen Noss to speak to it. Um, well, that was some, under the old administration, I think. I think a lot of the things have changed in child nutrition, and uh, I think this may have been because of the other the other, poly, or the other regulations that we had that maybe no longer are in effect. Because I know a lot of schools were losing a lot of vending money, mm -hmm. and we get a lot of complaints about that, uh, the schools losing money. So I think that might be one thing we might need to check to see if, I mean, I don't have a problem with schools having vending machines, yeah. but if some are doing it and some are not, I just want to be sure we're not in violation. Yeah. Some do it and some not. Let's 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 pull it and review it. Let's talk to Chris. Let's make sure we got it real tight. Let's, let's we'll pull it if you're fine with it, okay. and we can put it back on for next uh, next board meeting once we have clarity around that. Okay. Thanks. All right. Do I have a motion to approve board policy 3.600? I'm sorry. We got a motion motion to pull that. Right. Yes, I would like a, to pull this and for more clarification, yeah. please. Do we have a second? second? All right. Okay. Hang on just a second. 
And that was? That was 3.500. And Ms. Thurman and Mr. McClendon. Okay. Ready for the roll call? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Okay, on to board policy 3.600. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Ms. Ford? Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. And then lastly, board policy 3.601. So moved. Second. Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. All right, under board matters, I believe we have a suspension appeal. Dr. Bradshaw? Sir. Within your packet, you'll see the details um, outlining the incident that occurred. We had Mr. Bradley Jackson review the case, and we've made our decision um, subject to your um, your action, sir. Okay. Do we do we have a? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Mosley Jones. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I just want to say this, and I say this every time we do this, but I know, and I know this, but. I want the public, and I really wish the, the students could hear this. Things that are zero tolerance are illegal if you're 18 and older, pretty much. So a lot of times when they get um, into trouble or things happen at school, and it's a zero tolerance offense, and they go before Dr. Bradshaw and his team, and they work really hard with them. And I know even with our previous um, board who reviewed these, um, when Lee was here, when they reviewed them, they try very hard to make sure our students are still attached to some type of academic um, classroom setting, be it Washington, be it Ingenuity Online or something. The goal is not to disconnect them from learning. The goal is for them to learn that there is a consequence to a behavior. So with that being said, um, I'm going to just go ahead and say now when we get ready to vote, I'm going to support this because I'd rather a child learn now than to be 18 and at 601 Walnut or deceased or anything else that could happen to them. And I think the public really has to understand why it's so important that we as a village continue to educate our kids on what zero tolerance policies and offenses are in our school system so that they don't commit these illegal crimes when they get to adulthood. So I just want to put that out there. It's not that we're trying to punish a kid. We're trying to help them to learn now the consequences to negative behavior. Dr. Highlander. I think, did you make a motion to uphold the ruling? Yes. I second. I agree with you, I second. Okay, Ms. Ford. Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Lennon. Yes. Mr. McClendon. Yes. Mrs. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Thurman. Yes. Chairman Wingate. Yes. All right, that brings us uh, to Dr. Johnson. And do uh, you have anything you want to say here on these revisions? No, I'll just speak to both of them uh, very briefly. Uh, we're recommending uh, for the board that we move the May meeting to the 23rd um, due to the graduations that are taking place, uh, conflicts with Udawa High's graduation. Um, and item two, uh, the school calendar 2018-19, uh, two, two items uh, that affect 18-19 and 19-20. The day before uh, Christmas uh, should be noted as a half day. Uh, and then also we want to make sure we clearly articulate uh, in the 18-19 calendar that buses will run on the last day. We talked about uh, all of this at retreat, but this is uh, formalized to bring before you as a board. I make the motion we uphold these two. We need to do them one at a time. Do we correct? need to do them one at a time? Yeah. So the first, the, the revised schedule of sessions okay, for the May the board motion, meeting. I make the motion then revised schedule uh, sessions be approved. Second. Second. Okay, Ms. Ford. Dr. Highlander. Yes. Mrs. Hill. Yes. Mrs. Jones. Yes, and May 16th is my birthday, so if you see me that day, please say happy birthday. I'll be 38. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to say that's why we were moving. That's why we're moving it. Yeah. 
Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. Do I have a motion to approve the calendar revisions? So moved. Second. Dr. Highlander? Yes. Mrs. Hill? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Lennon? Yes. Mr. McClendon? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Thurman? Yes. Chairman Wingate? Yes. All right, that brings us to our events and announcements. Obviously, the Thanksgiving holiday coming up, November 21st through the 23rd. School closed. Central office closed 22nd, 23rd. Um, December 3rd, partnership advisory meeting. And then December 13th will be our next board meeting. Mr. Smith, you have another it's too now? early for us to get out of here, so let me get <laughs> Listen, this... Um, uh, the new truancy policy that, that was just put into place this year, and I, I guess, Dr. Drake, probably I need to talk to you. I don't know, but okay. it ain't working. And, I, you know, I'm just afraid. Uh, the, I mean, it just seems to me like it's too soft. And I met today with uh, with some some counselors at a couple of my schools, and uh, I yeah, and I don't, I certainly don't have the answer to how to fix it. But I mean, we're we're getting kids that have already missed a dozen days, and they still can't do nothing with the courts. And so I, I just hope that you guys are really paying attention to that. Hey, hey Joe, so, did they say what wasn't working? Yeah. Well, there's there's as I understood it, there's different tiers that they have to go through. Mm -hmm. Uh, before they can, the so it's state law, state law. Uh, I understand which supersedes that. Yeah. Um, our work. But we definitely, what we can do is we can definitely bring a report to the board around uh, kind of what we're doing yeah. and what we're seeing. In fact, uh, I will share with you all uh, in this Friday's update. Uh, Shannon Moody in our accountability research department, that team has done a full-fledged report. And I think we mentioned this at the retreat that on what they identified is on day eight. That's kind of the trigger mm -hmm. for chronic absenteeism, and we said that was the trigger to eighteen. So really what the state has done, because chronic absenteeism is a part of the uh, accountability, accountability framework, is it's really become more rigid versus being more loose because on day – what, what day five, a letter, talk, talk about yeah, the process. On day a five, a, a letter goes goes out. I think probably what you're talking about is that previously um, at – they could possibly send the child um, to court on day six. And what they try to do with the tiered process is work through why they're actually missing school and do some interventions mm -hmm. prior mm -hmm. to just sending them to court. Mm -hmm. And that's the process now is right. to work through it because um, another thing is, is that our cases were so... A backlog that even though you you sent it to court, it could be 60 to 90 days before they were actually heard at court. So what they try to do is to do a needs assessment and put some interventions in there at the school prior to sending them to court. Well, I, I think is you know, of course, I've been around this a long time. But I think what mm -hmm. traditionally has happened, those cases, you say they were they were backed up and they were coming down there. The, the uh, social workers were coming down to court in April and had a big stack of, of cases that had been piling up all year. Mm -hmm. And then schools out and the social workers only work what nine months a year, I think. And so, so that was a lot of the problem. Right. Yeah. So, and and. I did go to court during the summers, okay. so we still had representation yeah. at but, court. But I, I just, you know, those counselors I talked to today, they're just very concerned that, you know, they're trying to follow up with these parents and they're not getting any cooperation and those, you know, the different interventions that are in place with with that new system that, that the state, they're not just feeling real comfortable with it being successful. So just wanted to throw that out there and uh, something I think we so really need to pay attention to. Okay. And, and you know, I, I, I don't believe it's a kid problem anyway. I think it's a parent problem. But the, the kids that are learning to be truant in elementary school continue to be truant in middle school and then in high school. So we've got to get to them early. And it's a mama problem than more than it's a kid problem. So just want to get on the radar screen. Dr. Highlander. Uh, I just want to thank Tim Hensley. Put, we had the Freedoms Foundation Valley Forge 
Educator of the Year was Finley King for his support of, the, of that program, and a retired teacher, Diane Hale, who was a guidance counselor for many years and put, was the teacher of the year. She's recently retired, but uh, let me encourage any of you that have anything to do with the high schools, that if they have the children have an opportunity from any school in our county and, and the private schools as well to go to Valley Forge and with a chaperone, it's a highly educational program. They can write an essay. My daughter went and uh, sat under women in education. She she got to sit under Sandra Day O'Connor, who was the first female justice on the Supreme Court. Bill Gates has been there. It, it's something that Ivy League schools will appreciate for the children to get. So let me encourage you to get your, your young people to, to write the essay for, for uh, Freedom's Foundation. And thank you so much for that. Also, I have treats for uh, board members if they're not all gone. <laughs> Ms. Thurman. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, Dr. Johnson, I would like to see us meet with the state delegation. We We've done this in years past, maybe the state, because there's a few things. Uh, we talked about some of them at the retreat, about suspensions, expulsions, why the state punishes us for that. And I think that's really hurting some of our schools. The thing that Joe was talking about, I think they need to hear it from us and maybe have some of the counselors there to tell their situation and why it's a problem for them. And maybe because of that state law, like Nakia was saying, some of these things are state law. State law. That's where we need to go because we can't fix that here, and we need to talk to them and let them know our feelings. So um, to that point, we'll be sending a couple of date options potentially. We're going to try to get to them in December. Uh, we want to get them before they go to uh, Bless Up Delegation. We actually were just talking about this. Uh, uh, Jenny Picard and uh, Kate Schoenberg are putting it together. So we'll have them in. We'll share a little bit about our district, but then let them hear uh, the work. So we'll get some date options out there. This is Lynn. Um, we also talked at the retreat about the um, transportation policy work session happening after Thanksgiving. So can we send out a reminder about that because that's going to be no, the week next week's Thanksgiving. So that would be the week following so you can next, the week of the 26th. That I know that we really need to get on that. Because I will be out of the country that way. Um, and then the next thing that I wanted to ask is um, these policies that we are updating, um, I know that a lot of them that principals really need to be aware of some of the changes and are they getting all of this information? Because, I, I mean, I think it's awesome that what you're doing, some of them haven't been changed since 04, and um, I think they, they will impact some of the things going on at these schools. Um, and as we are working on communication, um, I think it's crucial that principals know what these policies are. Um, I get asked a lot of questions a lot of time. I think Joe and I even had conversation about um, sometimes the board gets blamed for things then there's no policies about those things. And we say, oh, that's a board policy. No, that wasn't a policy. So I think that ho I hope that they're being aware of these policy changes. All right, meeting adjourned. <laughs> Just, <laughs>